Remember the Yeah. Or the Senate. Yes, of course. Good evening and a warm welcome to the inaugural Manchester Centre for Correspondent Studies lecture and also a warm welcome to those of you who are watching this lecture from the comforts of your living room or wherever you are. My name is Douglas Field, I'm the co-director of the centre along with Professor Andrew Morrison. We're delighted to hold this evening's lecture in the magnificent John Ryland's library which has supported the centre enormous, enormously through its knowledgeable and approachable archivists. The wonderful team here has helped students, researchers, and visitors navigate the library's rich holdings from ancient cuneiform tablets to contemporary email archives. And please do explore the archives in the library, some of which can be accessed online. You can find out more about the center and future events by searching for Lives of Letters, University of Manchester which will pull up the center's website. And I'm delighted that Hugh Horton, Professor Hugh Horton, who taught me sometime last century, I won't say when, will be giving this evening's lecture, which is being live streamed and recorded. And I'm very pleased to hand over to my colleague, Professor John McAuliffe, who will introduce Hugh. Thank you very much. Um... Doug and uh, hello everybody. Um, I first I'm going to introduce Hugh briefly, um, and I'm really looking forward to uh, to what he's going to have to say tonight. I first came across Hugh Houghton's work in relation to my favourite poet Derek Mahan, for whose work Hugh long offered a reliable critical reference point. However, as a possessive reader of Mahan's poems, and I think poets are very often possessive readers of poets. I can't say I looked forward to even reading Hugh's big book um, on the subject. When it did appear, I found it, though, to be a typical and remarkable piece of writing itself, elegant and clear and informative. Derek Mahan is, of course, a poet for whom the letter and the life and biography and autobiography were key and carefully delineated subjects. And Hugh's writing on Mahan like Mahan's own work, had a, a similarly precise and insightful purchase on just how art and life intertwine. To quote Elizabeth Bishop, art copying from life and life itself, life and the memory of it, so compressed they've turned into each other. Hugh's careful interest in the relation between art and life has found in the letter and in correspondence, a perfect subject for his meticulous editorial eye and also as a subject of meditation. He is, as you will know, the editor with Valerie Elliott of an edition of T.S. Eliot's Correspondence, and he's also currently working on a book from which this talk, um, for which this talk offers us um, a preview. I should tell you further about Hugh's professional life. Born in Cork, um, he studied at Cambridge and Oxford before uh, joining the staff at York, where he has taught across his career and is now Professor Emeritus. He has written an introduction to one of the new Penguin Freud volumes on the uncanny. He has edited the anthology on the poetry of the Second World War, while his Chateau book of nonsense verse 
led to John Bailey reviewing him. And I really like um, the order of these adjectives as both delightful and learned. I should also add that I feel that I have come to know Hugh secondhand twice over, not just through his books and his essays, but also through his students. At Manchester, I work not just with Doug Field, but also with Peter Knight and Professor Ben Harker, also here tonight, for whom Hugh, I know, was a formative influence. Please join me now in welcoming Hugh Houghton to the Centre for Correspondent Studies. Thanks so much, John. And thanks, uh, Doug and Andrew, for um, inviting me here today. I don't think I've inaugurated anything. So uh, uh, it's wonderful to be at the beginning of something rather than the end. Um, I'm going to talk today, uh, I'll, be, I'll be skating on very thin ice. Lots of you will know much more than I do about some of the subjects that I'll be skating over uh, and, and with. In a typically weird and wonderful text about Henry James, Gertrude Stein asks, but what is the use of being interesting? She answers her own question with another. Of course, everybody who writes is interesting. Otherwise, why would everybody read everybody's letters? Stein's claim has a humorous universality. Of course, everybody who writes is interested, interesting. Otherwise, why would everyone read everybody's letters? Stein wrote a book with the impossible title of Everybody's Autobiography, and in a sense, letters and their new digital equivalents are everybody's autobiography. Signed, dated, and doubly addressed, with the writer's address twinned with the addressees, these doubly situated texts play a central role in our lives, offering a first-person insight into the writers in time and place. Plucked out of their original biographical and historical contexts, marked by addressee, addresses, date, envelope, and signature, they represent a form of everyday life writing that may subsequently occupy a crucial role in life writing more generally. With diaries, they provide the heartbeat of biography. I gather the Centre for Correspondence Studies grew out of seminars on the lives of letters. And Henry James's Aspen Papers, where I wanted to jump to quickly, was published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1888 during the heyday of the Victorian life and letters genre. The story dramatises the primal scene of pre-digital correspondence acquisition. Stein's remark on letters was made in relation to James, and his haunting Gothic fable tells of the desperate attempt of a ruthless literary scholar to get his hands on the love letters of a fictitious American romantic poet called Geoffrey Aspen, held in the Venetian apartment of his aged lover. It was loosely based upon Claire Claremont and her letters from Shelley. Uh, Shelley, uh, James's anonymous narrator, reports a revealing early conversation with Mrs. Prest. And I have pressed it, and it is working. One would think you expected to find in them the answer to the riddle of the universe, she said. And I denied the impeachment only by replying that if I had to choose between that precious solution and a bundle of Geoffrey Aspirin's letters, I knew indeed which would appear to me the greater boon. Those associated with the new correspondence centre might not endorse the ruthlessness of James Scholar and his quest for a bundle of epistolary revelations, but secretly sympathise with his obsession. We may not prefer reading letters to the answers to the riddle of the universe, but we do value the role of letters in answering and posing riddles of the human universe. An example would be the opening up of the long embargoed correspondence in 2020 of T.S. Eliot's uh, letters with his confident and muse, Emily Hay Hale, which she donated to Princeton in uh, 1956. Uh, when she did so, Eliot described it as the Aspen Papers in reverse. Uh, these letters were awaited with bated breath by Eliot scholars, and one of his biographers, Lyndall Gordon, has declared that in them, Eliot lays it all bare and is finally unmasked as a confessional poet. Some of us think it's a bit more complicated than that, but like Kafka's obsessional correspondence with Felix Bau and, and Elena Jezenska, it certainly reveals the poet's compulsive need to open 
up in letters to a safely absent lover. And the absent figure uh, in letters is always crucially important as, as, as the present writer. Correspondence opens up questions and offers answers to riddles in almost all disciplines. It's the most naturally interdisciplinary of studies, I regret. I come at it from a particular interest in literary letters, more specifically poets' letters, such, a, such as those of T.S. Eliot, which John mentioned. In a letter of 1971, writing for Ura Preto in Brazil, the American poet Elizabeth Bishop, who John quoted um, prophetically, told her gay pianist friends Arthur Gold and Robert Fitzdale she was preparing seminars at Harvard on letters, just letters, as an art form or something. I'm hoping to select a nicely incongruous assortment of people, Mrs. Carlyle, Chekhov, my aunt Grace, Keats, a letter found on the street, etc., etc. But I need some ideas from you both, just on the subject of letters, that dying form of communication. A great and prolific letter writer, Bishop's letter tells us a lot about the kinship between the art she was interested in, as practiced by great writers like Keats and Chekhov, and the art form of ordinary letter writing exemplified by her Aunt Grace on an anonymous scrap on the street. Bishop alerts us to the fact that every letter is a work of art, and ordinary correspondence is a literary form we all practice. She writes of letters as the dying form of communication, and no, some now think of it as dead. Nevertheless, while not everybody writes poems, plays, and novels, all literate people continue to exchange letters or their contemporary digital equivalents, emails which we might think of as ghosts of the letter, and this era as the era of the ghost of the letter. Paul Clay has a late painting called Geist eines Briefes, The Ghost of a Letter, which gives me my title. It's painted with pigmented paste on newspaper and is a portrait of an envelope rather than a letter. It's about being haunted by an envelope, and turns it into a melancholy portrait of the letter writer. My talk will be equally haunted by envelopes, the things that mark the difference between postal mail and email. Clay's image is of exteriority, but it simultaneously evokes internality, the letter inside the paper sheath, and interiority, the personality of the writer, a sad figure apparently looking out from a state of imprisonment. Painted in 1937, uh, soon after Clay had been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, scleroderma, the newspaper print glimpsed through the paint reminds us that both correspondence and journalism involved dated texts, two contrasted forms of news, one personal, the other communal. The boundaries of the envelope are painted black, as if, Brian Cummings observes, the letter is the traditional morning letter, commonplace in Bern in his Swiss childhood, though there is no sign of the letter's contents, elegiac or not. The palindromic figure on the envelope peers out at us mournfully like a captive child. Clay's witty title plays on the rich historical, spiritual and psychological associations of Geist in German, bringing together the Geistlich and the Zeitgeist, that elusive central issue in correspondence studies where everything is dated. Geist eines Briefes suggests both the ghost of a letter, an epistolary spectre come from back from the past, and the living spirit contained in a letter or in letters. The Gospel speaks of the contrast between spirit and letter, but Clay's image offers the letter as an embodiment of the spirit of correspondence, giving it the material form of an envelope. The picture doesn't represent the letter's address, just graphically, diagrammatically, the sketched head and shoulders of an epistolary person, an expressively pictographic representation of eyes, nose, and mouth in script form. The painter's pen suggests the presence of a hand and the graphic conventions of handwriting, though Clay notably doesn't actually show us handwriting, as so many paintings of letters like Vermeer's do. The ghost of the letter reminds us that the death of the letter has been announced over and over again. With the transfer of correspondence from snail mail to email, this has been portrayed more elegiacally than ever. Yet email itself can be seen as either the ghost of the letter or its rebirth in a new, less materially embodied form. 
Clay's haunting image insists on the materiality of the envelope and the paper he represents it on, even as it turns the letter into a ghost of a subject. Email, like the digital image of Clay's painting, offers a spectral or disembodied screen version of correspondence. Clay's image alerts us not only to the haunting nature of correspondence, but the crucial role of the envelope in their dissemination. A convenient container, but also a protective sheath, the envelope ensures confidentiality and privacy. Whether handwritten or typed, the signed letter represents a privileged form of personalised, if not always personal, communication. Nobody captures this better, I think, than Vermeer, who in the 1660s composed a miraculous series of six paintings, I'm going to show you four of them, intimately focused on the act of women writing, reading, and receiving letters, a subject he treats with the epic gravity of the fall of Troy. He takes this absolutely seriously, uh, and we can feel the subjectivity, not great reproduction here, um, uh, uh, of, of these women. Uh, viewers see women caught up in an intense experience of their own and another's subjectivity, utterly absorbed in communication with an absent correspondent while surrounded by all the material paraphernalia associated with writing. The National Gallery of Ireland's picture on the left dwells lovingly on the materiality of the letter as a thing, as well as on the pen, paper, desk, ink bottle, blotter on the desk, and the red seal, sealing wax, and possibly letter writing manual uh, on the floor. You can't really see it, probably, but the, you know, the, the sealing wax can be there, and that's a possible uh, letter writing manual. Uh, for, for more context for this, there's a wonderful book uh, by Peter Sutton called Love Letters, Dutch Genre Painting in the Age of Vermeer. It came out in 2003. For Vermeer, letters evoke the mystery of another's subjectivity, and it is letters alongside diaries which provide the most intimate access to the subject's voice in biography. In the biography-crazed 19th century, the Victorian genre of life and letters, which I mentioned, wedded lives and letters together. Now we generally divorce them, treating biographies as one thing, letters another. But they remain intimately allied forms of life writing. Carla Kaplan's Zora Neale Hurston, A Life in Letters, demonstrates the continued currency of the form, expanding the repertoire of known letters by this dazzling but controversial Harlem Renaissance writer from around 200 to over 600, and transforming our knowledge of the subject. Whether handwritten or, or, or typed, as you can see, they capture a voice like this of the postcard to Dorothy West in 1925 with its perma running, honey. You just, just hear that voice, come a running, honey. Like memoirs and diaries, letters are textual objects that tell us about subjects. They are also, however, forms of exchange which situate the writer in a network of family, friends, and others. Every letter, in this sense, is Janus-faced, facing towards the self of the writer and the self of the addressee. In a peculiar sense, every letter is both a historical document and a literary text. It has a double nature as the constructed voice of a subject and as an object, often contained within an envelope. But it has an object that has a special and defining role in how we constitute our lives with a small L and our lives with a big L, showing how we are constructed through dialogue with others. As mentioned, we live during or after a momentous transition in the life of letters, the move from material slow mail to instant mail, a moment haunted by the ghost of the letter as a material object, what we have come to call snail mail, an idea brilliantly encapsulated uh, in a letter of, Ed of Edward Lear of 1864. Uh, the text down below is pretty... Uh, bread and butter in the sense, but the letter is in the form of a snail, where the epistolary snail off offers a self-portrait of its author. And much of what I have to say about the letter as a material object today revolves around pre-digital pre snail text, 
uh, in an envelope like Leah's. Uh, another Leah letter to Marianne North of 1871 encloses a series of drawings documenting him getting one of her letters, concluding with a picture of him waving a stamped letter as Mr. Leah stamps and dances for joy on securing Miss North's letter. In a different vein to Vermeer, to put it mildly, Leah's letter dramatizes the crucial interdependence of writing and receiving, posting and reading, showing the inherently reciprocal and self-generating system of postal correspondence itself. With the digital revolution, the long forecast death of physical letters has led both to their displacement by email and their re resurrection as JPEG. Paradoxically, Digital culture has given us a new access to the materiality of the letter, albeit in screen form, like here, and to the epistolary archive as well. The ghost of the material letter is alive and well. We can now Google some of the earliest letters, uh, like um, this early uh, text of one of St. Paul's letters in Greek on papyrus, while we can also savour late, later medieval constructions of, of, uh, Paul, of Latin translations of Paul's texts in illuminated manuscripts, which foreground and imagine their, reimagine their personal and material transmission in scroll form from the saint to his addressees. Um, the Ephesians or Galatians are reduced to a singular monk in, in the present uh, on, on the right, and that captures something about historical, transhistorical transmission. We're seeing both something being given directly hand to hand uh, from, from the saint to, to the addressee, a, a Galatian, as it might be, but we're also imagining that transmission across time, where the tonsure uh, and so on uh, g g suggests a different date. If St. Paul is the most influential of all letter writers, perhaps, followed by Cicero or Erasmus, the most dazzling of English letter writers, I think, is John Keats, we might agree, who used his correspondence to improvise such haunting ideas as negative capability and life as a veil of soul-making, as well as for circulating poems to friends. But you now don't need to go to the Houghton Library in Harvard to see a huge trove of letters in the poet's hand since they, or their digital ghosts, are available online. Take this letter, uh, which was a flyer for an exhibition at Keats House, uh, which reproduces the last surviving manuscript of a Keats letter. It was written on 24th of October, 1820, from the address Naples Harbour, care of Giovanni. It was written to Mrs. Braun, the mother of his lover Fanny, just a few weeks before his death in Rome. Now, Keats is the most materially minded and sensuously aware of poets, and he notes in the letter that there is enough in this port of Naples to fill a choir of paper. Sadly, he didn't live to do that. He mentioned the letters may be opened for quarantine, celebrates having a knife and hair in a locket from Fanny with him, and wanting to send her grapes as other letters include texts of sensuous and grape-like poems like Ode to Psyche or Belle Dame Sans Merci or On Fame, which were in one letter to George and Georgiana Keats of 1819. But the digital image here reminds us of the sensuous materiality of ink, paper, packaging, the space of writing, the squashed signature, and the blurred final words, goodbye, Fanny, God bless you. It also shows how the poet's script has to fit in around the address as it is its own envelope, like all the letters of the time. I think it brings you closer to the moment of writing and of posting, uh, and it's thanks to, as it were, uh, the digital that we can see this. Keats sent poems and letters, like many other poets. The greatest American lyric poet, Emily Dickinson, who published almost nothing in her lifetime, chose to exclusively circulate hers uh, in correspondence with friends, in particular her sister-in-law and great love, Susan Dickinson. Dickinson wrote that publication is the auction of the mind of man, and in her lifetime her poems was only circulated in her own hand, enclosed in letters, 
with poems and letters working in tandem and often hard to distinguish from each other. The first person to publish her poems posthumously was Mabel Loomis Todd, who never met Dickinson but was the lover of her brother, Susan's husband, who lived next door. Dickinson sent Todd a poem in 1883, which is up on the screen, and which can be found in the online Dickinson archives dedicated to providing access to all her surviving autograph manuscripts. The lyric is written in her precise but wave-like hand, catching each quatrain in eight lines of manuscript, and is accompanied by an image of the envelope addressed to Todd. It begins, Further in summer than the birds, pathetic from the grass, a minor nation celebrates its unobtrusive, inobtrusive mass. Like many Dickinson poems, it is riddling with a pathetic minor nation in the grass left unnamed. If Todd was puzzled, the envelope also contained something else. The squashed dead body that solves the riddle of the poem. The archive describes the item as one sheet, one envelope, contains dried cricket wrapped in paper. The digital reproduction therefore restores not only the poet's manuscript and envelope, but the material remains of the poem's minor subject, the minor nation of the cricket. This brings us closer to the original moment of the poem, in a way, than any editorial transcription, especially Todd's own very misleading one. The same is true of such a poem as This Quiet Dust Was Gentlemen and Ladies, which was sent to Susan Dickinson. But the text reads, This quiet dust was gentlemen and ladies and lads and girls, was laughter and ability and sighing and frocks and curls. This passive place, a summer's nimble mansion where bloom and bees fulfilled their original circuit then ceased like these. Emily. The poem celebrates human and animal vitality that's lost in death, but the dusty poem or letter is given new life as a digital ghost or J JPEG. Dickinson clearly thought of poems and letters as aligned, and she was particularly fascinated by envelopes or envelopes, and I don't ever seem to know how to pronounce it, like me. In 2013, uh, Jen Bevan and others published The Gorgeous Nothings, Emily Dickinson's envelope poems, with wonderful images of texts that may or may not be poems written on scraps of envelopes. Once more, emphasizing the strong association of poetry and epistolarity, in these poems, the accidental shape of the piece of paper helps determine the form of the text as in this torn triangular example here. There are those who are shallow intentionally and only profound by accident. The poem or aphorism, whether shallow or profound, is shaped by the material form of the paper in a happy blend of accident and intention. It's a visual object as much as a text, and gorgeous nothings is an apotheosis of the poetics of the envelope and includes a fascinating range of these fascinating objects. A more recent master of envelope art is the great nonsense poet and artist uh, Edward Gorey, a modern avatar of Edward Lear, who I have no room to discuss, but I just wanted to share a few graphically animated examples of his envelopes, showing Gorey's mischievously morbid or morbidly mischievous invention of grotesquely absurd animals uh, as a way of reinventing the dull form of, of a letter's address. The letters of visual artists like Gorey and Lear are particularly con conscious, of course, of the visual dimension of correspondence that I'm trying to talk about. Uh, as Keats or Dickinson included poems, a couple of the painter Edward Manet's letters uh, of 1880 uh, include wonderful watercolor vignettes of a snail on leaves, for example, or fruit, combining epistolarity and visual art, cheek by jowl. Van Gogh's 
sorry, the pause. Van Gogh's wonderful letters, the painterly equivalent of Keats's, also brim over with visual material, often discussing his own painting and reproducing them in sketch form, as in this letter from Arho to his brother Theo of 21st of November 1888, with its sketch of my last canvas. The um, visuals are pretty weird with the reflections of this wonderful room, but I hope you can get some sense uh, of, of, the, of the, t the text that uh, he's talking about, the sketches there. Uh, and, and the letter frames it in an interesting way in the account of his investment in Rembrandt, uh, Sylvester's book on Delacroix, color theory, um, offering us ways of thinking about the painting that the letter um, alludes to. Uh, one last, oh, uh, one last, uh, uh, I, and I won't talk about this, but it's a letter of Cezanne to Emile Zula, uh, and it, it, it refers to uh, a, a picture of his sister that he's just made, and this weird uh, painting here of Marion and Balabrec departing for the motif in 1866. But it captures that moment of, of, of Cezanne painting. And, and he's painting other painters, and this moment where people set off into a landscape to capture the motif. Uh, and digital or photographic reproductions of autograph letters like this bring us uncannily closer to their original moment uh, and form. Postcards as Derrida reminds us of a particularly visual form of correspondence, and just I just want to look, flick past, if you can see them, two of these. Uh, which are by Picasso. One gives us a, a, the only message of this, this postcard is the head, this cubist head. Uh, and it's the back of a card that is a kind of traditional image. And there's something wonderfully haunting about the, just the front and back uh, of the envelope. Uh, this is another one to Apollinaire, who simply asks, uh, uh, I don't see you anymore. Are you dead? Um, but it also includes sketches of, of, of him in the south of France, set against Apollinaire uh, in, in Paris. I'm going to use that to make a kind of jump to reflect on war poems and war letters more generally. Apollinaire died of wounds shortly afterwards. Uh, and I want to use this postcard to think about uh, kind of that very urgent form of correspondence, um, war letters, uh, where people are desperate for company, need to communicate, need to be in touch with the home world. Apoll Apollinaire's Lettre à Madeleine print a vast outpouring of messages sent by the poet from trenches and military hospitals during World War I to a woman he just met on a train en route to battle. One of them, dated 15th of May 1915, begins by thanking her for a card, detail and, and offers details of life in the trenches. We stopped to look at several unexploded Bosch Austrian shells then continued on our way till we came upon a battery belonging to another regiment that was then taking up position. Zoom, bang, an Austrian 88 exploded four steps away from us and the gunners of other regiments shouted to us to take refuge in their barely completed underground shelters. But the bombardment continued. We were flat on our stomachs, crawling. Apollinaire imagines sending her um, a ring made from a bullet as an amusing war souvenir, but also sends one of his signature concrete poems or calligrams uh, in, the, in the envelope with this letter. Under four lines of conventional verse, the world, words are formed into a star shape uh, to, to above it. Down uh, below. More bizarrely, they're written on a fragment of bark from a birch tree. Uh, it's one of these wonderful things that a letter, the envelope, is containing a war poem, concrete poem, that one of the calligram that he specialized in, uh, and it's on tree bark, one of the available forms of paper to him uh, in the trenches. Um, and simply, I, I just read a little bit of it, an étoile. Obus miaul, j'écris au pied d'un sol. Uh, a visible shell winds, I write beneath a willow tree. 
and then we get in the shape of a star, l'étoile du berger déjà comme les crêtes d'un raja, shepherd's lamp already like a raja's plume, and then in the shape of a cannon, or, ou comme une œillade chérie brille sur notre batterie, or like a beloved watcher shining above our battery. Under the bark text, Apollinaire signs his name, uh, Guillaume Apollinaire, written at the front, 15th May, 1915. We can get closer to the testimony of the realities of warfare when we're confronted with digital versions also on Oxford's The First World War Poetry Digital Archive. There's the English translation. Um, and here, an undated letter in which the young Jewish uh, London poet and artist Isaac Rosenberg sent Edward Marsh, which has a self-portrait captioned underneath Isaac Rosenberg, his outer semblance. On the right-hand side, he gives his identity as 2231, Private Rosenberg, 11th, Cooks, K-O-R-L-B-E-F, and then curving over the top of the paper from the right, now written upside down, he writes, I've gone back to the trenches and send you this souvenir, like a boy now. Above is my new address. The line above my helmet is the German front, a hundred yards away. This is him just off the top, and then again, uh, uh, wavering at the top of, 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 the, of the image. A line is such an expressive, it's, it's a line that is capturing the German line. But the rubbed, stained, pencil-scrawled paper here bears witness as only a letter can, marinated in the grim circumstances of the moment of writing. A letter to Gordon Bottomley of August 1917 includes his poem, The Jew, about anti-Semitic prejudice. The blonde, the bronze, the ruddy, with the same heaving blood keep tied to the moon of Moses, then why do they sneer at me? And I think you read those lines and then you see the envelope uh, and then the with the British expeditionary force and those the lines about anti-Semitism are given a very strong material, cultural uh, and political context by the envelope uh, and, and by the form. Uh, here's an example just look at it briefly, but of a letter to his father um, uh, where he's being shaped in a sense a little bit like the Emily Dickinson uh, poem by the shape of, of the scrap of paper. And it, it, it's, a, it's a minimal letter, October 1917, coloured by the Yiddish word Yom Tov for holiday. And Rosenberg writes to say, everything is contained in I am fit. But this scribbled piece of torn paper, I think, tells us something beyond the reassuring words uh, of the fragmented letter. A draft of one of Rosenberg's most barbed poems in the trenches was sent in a letter to Sonia Rodker in June 1916. And the digital ghosts of the letter and the poem haunt by doing the crucial things the letters do, anchoring text in actual space and time. The injured body of the pencil-scribbled letter and poem speak volumes about the conditions under which Ro Rosenberg has written what he calls his commonplace uh, lyric. Here's a little poem, a bit commonplace, I'm afraid, and it ends, Down, shell, Christ, I'm choked, safe, dust blind, I see trench floor poppies strewn, spashed, smashed, you lie. The letter situates the poem biographically and historically with its autobiographically charged claim, I was taciturn in England, I am ten times so here. One's struggle to express oneself is a fearful joke. The digital image captures the ghost of the original letter in all its subjective objecthood and its struggle to express which is captured in the torn, worn poem. Such World War I letters existentially situate the testimony of war poems. And beside them, I just want briefly to set three write, written by non-literary participants in World War II, 
now housed in the Smith's Smithsonian. And, and I'll follow them with one other poetic example. Here is a Bullets Guard letter of the US Army Private John McGrath, written during the US liberation of Italy in World War II. Second is a letter of Jean Sobolewski of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, mailed to her fiancé in 1942 and returned to her because he was dead. Third, well, that's, that's completely misplaced. We seem to have, there's a serious, serious hiatus here. Uh, Let's stick with this for the moment, but I seem to have lost, but that's fine. Um, uh, the third no, is lost, paradoxically. Um, but the fourth here uh, takes us back to uh, the horror of war and the Holocaust. And it's a manuscript by the great Hungarian poet Miklos Rednoti, a Jew sentenced by the Nazis to forced labor and shot in the head on 4th of November. 1944. It's a letter poem, one of four postcards or Razglik Nietzsche's, and was found in a notebook in the pocket of his overcoat when his corpse was exhumed from a mass grave in 1946. In Francis Jones's translation, it reads, I tumbled beside him, his body twisted, and then, like a snapped string, up it sprang again. Neck shot. This is how you'll go too. I whispered to myself, just lie easy now. Patience is blossoming into death. Dear spring, knock out, rang out above me. Mud dried on my ear, mingled with blood. And the poem is built around the string, the neck, shot, the mud, ear, blood. Very material. But this buried prophetic postcard poem, the poem was actually shot, the poet was shot in the head as he prophesied. It was dug up posthumously and its digital image uh, provides a ghost of the resurrected body of the manuscript. Uh, and I've set it beside his last letter to his wife, a record of damage of many kinds as, as well as a kind of miraculous survival. I am now drawing to a close. I hope I'm not gone on too long. I've shuffled my pack of images of physical letters, but which I hope testify to their vitality as speaking objects, running the gamut from the knockabout of Lear's letter to the final mortal witness of Radnotti's. The Centre for Correspondence Studies is uniquely placed to address the trans transdisciplinary, transhistorical, transcultural centrality of letters. It's hard to think of a subject where correspondence doesn't play a crucial, crucial role. Not only literature, classics, history, philosophy, theology, politics, history of art, music, sociology, women's studies, queer studies, psychoanalysis, and so on, politics. Since classical times, the letter has been recognized as an art form, a form that literature can appropriate or mimic, uh, witness the epistles of Horace, or the fictitious letters of famous historical and mythological women in Ovid's Heroides, giving voice to Penelope, addressing Homer's Odysseus, or Dido writing back to Virgil's representation of Aeneas, or, as we saw, Radnotti's postcards. Historically, classical Greece and Rome put the letter on the literary map. Andrew knows much more about this, and I'm skating on thin ice, with public collections of letters such as Cicero's uh, and others. Um, and Cicero was the first to distinguish between public and private letters, as I understand it. The Ministry of Legal and Political Letters go back to the earliest Middle Eastern civilizations, but it was in classical Rome it acquired literary as well as practical status uh, alongside the epistles of Paul, which we mentioned earlier, and later Christian commentators such as Jerome. The epistolary text I suggest, always carries a ghost of its materiality, its sense of personal hand-to-hand -hand transmission, the human need for company. And this colors the cultural imaginary which shapes Elizabeth Bishop's sense of letters as an art form. If Christianity is unimaginable without the epistles of Paul, it's equally hard to imagine classical Rome without the letters of Cicero or Pliny. 
of the Renaissance without the sense of selfhood and sociability articulated in the letters of Petrarch after his rediscovery of Cicero, or the great web of correspondence through which Desiderius Erasmus acted out his role as a humanist scholar at the heart of an international intellectual web. It's equally impossible to imagine the 18th century enlightenment of that the correspondence of Jonathan Swift, Lady Workley Montague, Voltaire, or the Romantic period without of Wollstonecraft, Byron, and Keats, or the 19th century without love letters of Elizabeth Barrett and Robert Browning, Flaubert's love letters about novel writing, Gerard Manley Hopkins' about poetry. In the 20th century, the letters of Virginia Woolf, Yeats, Eliot, Pound, Marion Moore, Bishop, Zora Neale Hurston, and a thousands of others, not only provide crucial insights into the working of their lives, but the literary and political culture of the time. R writers and artists like the rest of us are rarely isolated geniuses, but exist in great webs of correspondence. The letter was also one of the great spurs to the invention of the novel in the 18th century. With Samuel Richardson's invention of the epistolary novel in Pamela and Clarissa offering access to new social forms of subjectivity. Uh, this continues. Um, this is where my weird ghostly PowerPoint um, has a problem, but the, it continues um, where the letter continues to be a model and resource for modern fiction, as we can see in John Burge's A to X, a story in letters made up of sent and unsent letters to the last prisoner in cell number 73 in the wake of the Iraq war. Uh, and again, in the contemporary Lebanese novelist, wonderful novel, Hoda, Hoda Barakat's Voices of the Lost, a kind of chain letter composed by five anonymous letter writers displaced and exiled one way or another, writing confessionally to lovers or family members, with all the texts bearing the marks of trauma and dispossession and alienation from an unnamed Middle Eastern country and a place of exile. These novels, too, imagine letters very vividly and physically as written in an ink that the cloth is somewhat blotted, for example, in Berger, or in, in Barakat, the letter looks a bit old because the paper it is written on looks old. But they, these engage with political matters of great political urgency. So if for Bishop in 1971 letters were a dying form of communication, we might now be said to be in the era of their afterlife. In the era of email, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the multiplying forms of digital communication, letters are often thought of as a thing of the past, even though they continue for important events and for bills and, and various other begging letters and so on. But letters, of course, are only one form of correspondence, as you all know. Looked at from another side, the new digital form of email, text, and Twitter can be said to have revived and multiplied correspondence, transferring the letter from paper to the ether and thereby dematerializing it rather than superseding it. In the complete absence of the corporeal realities of handwriting, ink, stamps, and envelopes, emails offer a spectrally dematerialized form of correspondence that mainly serves us just as well. Now, I'm just going to wind up, if that's okay, with a last little um, personal anecdote. Is that okay? Um, it's about this new hybrid moment where the ghost of the physical letter coexists with the digital. In 2013, Seamus Heaney gave a reading at York, an event which involved a little bread and butter correspondence. I'd initially written a couple of letters to the poet by snail mail, but unsurprisingly, given how busy he was, didn't get a response. I then received an email from someone called Susie with a high number, something like Susie1946, which I almost deleted as a dodgy unknown contact. It turned out to be Seamus and began, Dear Hugh, you'll have given up on me, probably have had a contract taken out on me, but I was leaving the email as a last resort because I do my best to pretend that I don't use it. You can well imagine what that saved him. And there followed a typically generous self-mocking letter, agreeing to come and ending, if anything works out, I could appear in sackcloth. Luckily, it did work out, and Seamus duly appeared, not in sackcloth, dutifully rising as ever to the occasion of poetry. After leaving, he left an upbeat, old-fashioned, handwritten letter of thanks, accompanied by a bottle of wine, 
and later I got a brief thank you text by phone where he wrote, I'm sorry to have been such a bother to you, and you've been such a dear brother to me, I'll write next week. S. Signed print of a, po uh, print of a poem duly arrived the following week, inscribed for me and my partner. Since Seamus died less than two months later, all those different forms of correspondence became italicized in the imagination. Now, none of these will form part of the poet's published letters edited by Christopher Reed. We're not talking about the Aspen papers here. Nevertheless, this little exchange of email, letters, texts, and a poem foregrounds in my mind some of the questions I've been mulling over about correspondence in the age of digital revolution and, and, and how they could be archived. All these formerly different texts have com comparable standing and bear Heaney's signature that fundamental mark of the letter. They also remind us that the letter, in whatever form, physical or digital, plays an essential part in what Heaney calls the human chain. Manchester's Centre for Correspondence Studies establishes a fabulous collaborative forum for studying the human chain in action, in multiple media across time and space. If the letter is now a ghost of itself, as Paul Clay intimated on the threshold of World War II, it continues to give unique expression to the individual human geist or spirit as well as our shared zeitgeist. Likewise, if email is a digital ghost of the letter, the digital has also given past and present correspondence a new lease of life, as I hope I've shown. So I hope this Center for Correspondence Studies will give new oomph to Gertrude Stein's lovely democratic claim. Of course, Everybody who writes is interesting. Otherwise, why would everybody read everybody's letters? Thank you very much. Thanks. And we are now open for questions, if anyone has any. Um, with a roving mic. Fun. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, that was wonderful. Uh, what a, an excursion across um, so many wonderful letter writers. Um, I'm going to start with an anecdote as well, which was that Seamus Heaney, when he did readings here, used to communicate us, with us by fax alongside um, other things. We had one fax machine left in our school, in the Mansfield Cooper building, which you'd never know anything had arrived. You'd, you'd come across things again the same way. <laughs> you know? yeah. And the little thin paper with the little tiny bits of ink that were left in it. Um, some yeah. other university colleagues might remember those fax machines. Yeah. And um, Lee said that Philip Roth once sent her an entire novel by fax, oh, one of the longer oh, ones, and they just sort of just churned out, ran out of paper, ran out of paper, ran out of paper. Yeah, sorry. Well, so I do have a question for you, which is, it's, you know, you mentioned the um, Lyndall Gordon's response to the Elliot um, correspondence. And I guess the, there is a there is a um, something seductive, but also dangerous about the letter as a context for the poem. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, say the Emily Dick the astonishing Emily Dickinson poem is hardly resolved yeah. by the cricket. But no, but I think really the key thing, if you think of the letter as, as the resolution to the problems of of of, of the written. Uh, I mean, El Eliot talks about the separation of the the uh, mind, what is the person that suffers and the mind that creates. Uh, but the letter is another form of the literary, um, uh, and, and the case, especially in the case of someone like Eliot. Um, Eliot somewhere wrote that his, te his, his texts, if they were autobiographical at all, were as if they were written in a foreign language. Uh, um, so, I, I think th that Little Gordon's claim that somehow that he just this is the naked Eliot and he's spilling it out, and this is as where the reality behind the writing is bonkers. Um, that, that this is more of Eliot, the writer. It's a different form of writing because it's it, it, because it's to um, this figure intimate from his past. But he didn't find it that easy to to be with her live and found ingenious ways of being apart from her uh, over the years.
possibly in order to generate correspondence. But they don't seem to me, they certainly don't suggest the poems themselves are, as Gordon says, uh, um, confessional. That seems to be completely up the creek. Um, so in that sense, we turn to letters not as as well, revealing the, 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 the biographical truth, but another form of literary construction, um, which will presumably be disguised as well as reveal, and reveal by the way it disguises. Um, we may well have had enough of all this by now, so I, um, but if there are other questions, um, yeah. Um, I wondered if you could say something about um, what Bishop means by the art of the letter and about the artfulness. What are the kinds of artfulness that you mm. find in this range of letters you've looked at? Yeah, I mean, I, it's interesting the degree, I mean, correspondence manuals I mentioned very, very briefly uh, in the um, in reference to the Vermeer painting in the National Gallery in Dublin. Um, uh, Obviously, people worked hard to create uh, the forms. We had to all learn the forms of the letter, like the forms of poems, not the dear so-and-so remains astonishingly uh, intact after centuries and centuries of usage as the way in which to begin a letter. Um, but letters have, have a way um, of you're given freedom within the confines of the form, as you are in other forms. Um, and the way Byron perform, performs a letter, say, or Marianne Moore performs a letter, uh, they're incredibly inventive. Uh, and the Lear showed how, I mean, it, it is letters linguistically and graphically are incredibly original. So that way in which letters, um, good letters, but and bad letters also depend on art, um, but it may not be quite such a nifty, agile art. Um, uh, but it seems to me that letters uh, potentially offer one of the richest um, forms of, of is it self-portraiture, self-expression, um, but not probably self-portraiture necessarily. Um, and I mean, Henry James's letters and Hemingway's couldn't be more different. Virginia Woolf's couldn't be much more different from Eliot's that we corresponded a lot. Um, and it was one of the nice things about working um, on the Eliot archive and working on the letters was that sitting in Mrs. Eliot's flat, all the incoming letters were there around the shelves. So you had the original manuscripts of Virginia Woolf or W.S. Graham uh, or Ezra Pound or, or, or just almost anybody in the intellectual world across Europe um, on the shelves. Um, so you were deciphering their handwriting as much as you were kind of deciphering Elliot, and so you're looking at different hands and the, the physical forms of writing, but you're also very aware of the different styles, you know, of a Wyndham Lewis, who, who, who on pages is like the author of Time and Western Man, or uh, Virginia Woolf, who in one, uh, you know, who, who is very funny and teasy with him, and, and him writing to her talks about... Um, she sees, she sees them as someone who seems to be wearing a four-piece suit, uh, as if there could be such a thing. I mean, so they, they play off his formality against her Mr. Bloomsbury mischievousness and so on. So you can see it in specific correspondences. And, and on the way here in the train, I'm reading the letters of um, Sylvia Townsend Warner, who I think is one of the great writers of, of the 20th century. And her letters are just, you know, you've just... You see language at work transforming everyday life. It just, it cannot, you know, she cannot be boring. She just can't do it. Um, and it's wonderful to see that, that inventiveness in terms of di just ordinary stuff, ordinary reporting of everyday life. And that's one, you know, and if you're reading Swift or, or Coleridge um, or uh, Flaubert uh, or, you know, or, or Bishop, you, you know, you just every, the everydayness of life is is transformed, um, and you see style in action. Um, it may not be the same style as their literary style exactly, but you see the work that style can do 
to transform the currency of, of the everyday, the bread and butter, into something rich and strange. Yeah. Um, I apologize if this is a uh, very basic question when it comes to uh, the study of letter writing, but um, is it is there an ethical question about making the personal extremely public? I mean, I was thinking about how I would feel if my last correspondence with my mother before being shot in the head was published for all to see, um, or, or anybody's. Uh, that's all I was thinking. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a great question. Uh, and there's a question of permission, I suppose. Uh, Radnotti, in his case, uh, he certainly did everything he could to preserve his poems um, in the notebook and so on that, that happened. Um, I don't know what his line on his letters was. Uh, w. H. Auden wanted all his letters burnt um, and thought it was really impertinent to anybody to read anybody's letters. But he did spend quite a lot of time reading other people's letters and s celebrated them. Uh, and he wrote wonderful verse letters. Uh, as well, um, th there must be ethical questions if if one feels this is despite the intentions of the letter writer or or the addressee, um, uh, and a lot of authors spent, you know, at the end of their lives, spent a lot of time burning their letters. Thomas Hardy spent ages burning his letters, like Larkin burned his diaries or had his diaries burnt. Um, so I, I think. It's a really hard, if things survive and are in our archives, it's very hard not to think they should be published um, uh, unless there's been the, you know, absolute prohibitions. Uh, but prohibitions are never that absolute. Um, one anecdote, can I give you, have you type it? I, I once was at a conference in Venice, uh, a Joyce conference, and in it, Stephen Joyce, the grandson, who looked the spit of, of, of his granddad, uh, stood up and said, uh, I, you know, I have acquired the letters of Lucia Joyce, um, his daughter, Joyce's daughter, um, and I want to make sure they're never published and I will burn them. Uh, and I'm just furious about uh, Richard Elman, who published one of the kind of rather um, coprophiliac letter of Joyce's um, and uh, which was meant not to be published. Um, so he was showing us one attitude of the family to the archive. Then a, a very distinguished white-haired figure stood up just in front of me and it was Michael Yates, the poet's uh, uh, son. Uh, and he said, I don't think we should ever destroy anything. We should send them to libraries and put um, if we feel uh, it's too compromising or too personal or too intimate or c compromises somebody else, we should ensure that a library puts an embargo on it, like uh, Elliot put on the Emily Hale correspondence. Um, but he said, you should be able to put something embargoed for some time um, so that it can't hurt in the same ways. And then just eerily as could be, a third figure stood up and it was uh, Mary Rackerville, who's Ezra Pound's daughter. And they just happened to be in this room. The main event was elsewhere. And she looked just like her dad, as Michael Yates looked. And it was just, you could see physiognomy, uh, but you also saw the predicament of, of the family coping with the, the question of, of, of letters. And uh, Mary Rackerville said, I believe everything in my father's should be published, and every, in the end, it, everything uh, will vindicate him, um, despite the attraction to Mussolini and the, the anti-Semitic um, cantos and so on, but that everything uh, will not only should be published but ethically, but because it would justify uh, father's work. That's a weird way to answer or not answer your question, but it shows the way that Families have to, and, and, and uh, people in charge of archives, uh, uh, executives and so on, the kind of decisions they have to make. Uh, and clearly, they, they must sometimes be very complicated ethical ones. 
like the ethical, you know, when Max Broad was told to burn all Kafka's works, he, he just overrode that. And, um, you know, we are the beneficiaries, but there may be times when we are also, you know, like the narrator of the Aspen papers, we are, you know, um, trespassing deeply. Thank you, Hugh. It's a great talk. Uh, you, you talked a lot about um, letters um, that contain poems, but I wondered whether the project also takes in poems that sort of impersonate letters. You know, I'm thinking like John Cornford's poems. You know, we don't have many poems from him, but you know, letter from Aragon or the, the letter, to the, the poem to Margot Hahn and Heinemann yeah. that are you know, imitating uh, yeah. letters in some way. I mean, it's fascinating that from from the classical period, poets have. You know, Horace's epistles where people have thought the letter is a really interesting form to use uh, poetically. Um, uh, and I didn't talk about it because it, it's it, it's deeply associated with this. I mean, the, someone like Keats, the letter to Reynolds, James Reynolds, there's one in one is in verse and the others are in prose. And the prose, of course, is just as wonderful uh, as the verse. But you can see him playing in a romantic way. It's not a great romantic uh, form, but he, he uses it you know, because it's been Pope and Swift and Gay have used it in the 18th century and wonderfully. Um, but it's a, a rare case of, 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 of him uh, moving into that. And Elizabeth Bishop has a wonderful letter, the old letter poem. I mean, there are all the way through across time that you know, poets continue to write letter poems. Um, uh, I was reading some the other day sent sent me by um, an American poet friend, um, letters from Spain, uh, but and they are drawing upon as it were the cultures of intimacy, and the the report from the moment of the that kind of situatedness uh, of writing. Uh, Derek Mahan talks about Swift having a a great situational gift. And letter writers, the, the good ones, that's what the, you know, it, it draws upon that. The letters will give us the situations of writing, but a good letter performs its own situation in interesting ways, and as, as Pope's do or, um, uh, or Swift's. Um, so it is a great form, but I sort of, um, it probably doesn't depend in the same way upon the material, uh, materiality of, 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 convention, of, of the convention that it's imitating. Because they are kind of they are letters, but they're also impersonated letters in that sense. Um, they they can be both things, um, but it is obviously a different art to impersonate a letter um, uh, poetically. Um, but it's a great it is a great question. It's wonderful that you know poems poets have 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 gravitated towards the letter. And I think there are deep. They're founding in a, a, you know ground, shared grounds between the two, especially for lyric poetry. Thanks, Hugh. That was wonderful. Um, we were talking earlier about James Baldwin, and it's a source of great frustration that the estate yeah. won't publish his letters and his um, magnificent um, letter to his nephew, which became the fine next time published in 62 yeah. originally uh it just gives a little insight and i, I have uh, covertly uh read quite a few of the letters but i can't quote them i can in fact i'm talking about the letters in in leuven on friday but uh, i can't publish it because i they would sue and and, and you know they're very aggressive about that so anyway, just i have just to sort of share that um but i'm, I'm really interested when, when you were working on the elliot letters did you get a sense at some point that he was aware that the letters would be published and that there's a there's a kind of formative aspect where you're not just writing to someone but you know in a sense mm. that it's quite likely that they'll be published or uh, uh or, or, or you know collected mm. in archives and therefore there's another performance because you're kind of writing not just to the um, addressee mm. but you're also writing for posterity and so forth yes and someone like pope clearly was and he you know, published his, his his letters in that way but Eliot, in many places talks about his horror of his letters being published in in 1933 he writes his letter 
to his brother Henry and says, I've just got all the letters that mum, I sent to mum over the years. And they went, his mum had written a few years earlier that she had all his letters from school, from Harvard, from Paris, from his early life. And Elliot said, I, 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 I bought them and I burnt them all. Um, and I would love to leave as little biography as possible and to destroy every letter. Uh, and he only agreed to have his letters published if his second wife, Valerie, would do the choosing uh, and the publishing. Um, so I think he's acutely aware, as let good letters writers are, of, of who he's writing to. He writes quite differently to Ezra Pound, often in mock poundies, uh, than he does to Virginia Woolf. Uh, or t you know, he, he's very aware of audience. Um, uh, but I think he genuinely was horrified at the idea of his privacy being broached in the ways that you, you, your question um, suggests earlier. And in the Elder Statesman, his last play, he talks, uh, there's a, an Elder Statesman who comes across a woman who is, uh, has got intimate letters of his um, and she's going to have them, they'll be used in court uh, against him. Uh, and she reads them every evening, but she only reads them in photostat form because she wants to keep them safe. Uh, and clearly he's really dreading the idea that these uh, Emily Hale letters have been have been given to an archive and will be published. But he hoped that leaving the the, the publication of, of his letters to his his uh, second wife, who had been his secretary, so she was always taking dictation from Elliot during the end of his life and continued to take dictation till the end of hers and that terms of, of transcribing them. Um, but he, I think, he'd be absolutely horrified by the endless procession of these wonderfully edited volumes now written by John Haffenden that are coming out. Um, uh, and he did say the, the, um, the impulse to write a letter that's only for one person to read is, 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 is indelible and, and um, that valuable. So he must have been caught up in an ambivalence about, about this. I think it's... Oh, oh you have a, yes, a question. Okay. Um, sorry if I'm not like super eloquent or things like that. I have a hard time putting my thoughts into words. But I'm really interested in like a kind of perceptions of writing as power. And like letter writing in particular is one of those really interesting ones because obviously writing was a technology and an invention and one only accessible to a very specific few for a long time. And you're talking mostly about like ex um, examples from, uh, you know, some of the like uh, like keystones of literature and things yeah. like that, as well as like you know some war poems and things like that. So I almost think of letter writing as this intersection, especially with the invent, especially with mass literacy, where uh, the personal actually becomes a powerful way to actually intersect with writing, and then how that kind of transforms and develops in our like kind of this new sort of technology age, where writing as a technology is transforming in a whole new way with a bunch of different performances um, being addressed across a wide variety of areas as we, as writing becomes both private and public, but then accessible to everyone. So I'm really curious about the intersection of letter writing and kind of the private, but then also as like an intersection of power as, a, as kind of a writing form that becomes inherently accessible to those whom writing has been inaccessible for such a long period of time. I mean, it's a great question. I, I, I could, I'm not in a position even to begin to answer it, but it, it, it's crucial. Um, and it, you, you see it when you get a new, uh, a new cast of, of letter writers, I suppose. Uh, I came across it again with a poet, but it's a, it's a old case. But John, John Clare, for example, who, who's moving for, as it, from being a, a, a village laborer to being a, a national poet and who's, he does this very voluminous correspondence, is working, working into literacy uh, and trying to deal with these questions about uh, literary language and his own vernacular um, in, in uh, Northamptonshire. Um, and there are other, I mean, some of the slave letters um, 
uh, uh, be other interesting things. I had some examples that I didn't use, where, where you, you you see as what people both you rhetorically um, adopting and appropriating the, the letter form, and the, you know the literary and the literary are pretty are closely um, involved, uh, and you can feel the the power relations in play uh, when when new um, kinds of writer are entering the literary arena, the political uh, arena, um, and you know I, th I think that's that's a, a, a fantastically important uh, area. And kind of politic, the power of the letter writer. I mean, I mentioned well, I St. Paul or Erasmus or Eliot. These people are really powerful makers and shapers uh, of opinion uh, in their time, or Virginia Woolf or or Maria Moore, um, uh, but uh, and I so it would be great to, to be able to look more at that that key moment of access uh, uh, and how that's rhetorically done as well as how it actually happens. But it it itself requires an access uh, of 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 art. You know, it, it's not that there are kind of raw letter writers and cooked, but there are different forms of of, of art. As people enter the epistolary uh, arena uh, for their own purposes, so I can't answer the question, but it raises absolutely fundamental uh, issues. I think about the politics um, of of writing. Thank you, the, uh, thank you very much indeed. I can hear Elliot. Hurry up, please. It's time. Yeah. In in not not that you've uh, 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 overstayed. You you've been wonderful. We could listen to you for, for for hours, but we're very grateful that you've come down from York and and for inaugurating this uh, centre. Um, so um, thank you very much indeed. Uh, you, you've been wonderful. Thanks for being such a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.